CalSTAR News, an alternative news commentary program. Uh, the one serious problem is unemployment. And uh, we've been talking about full employment and passing legislation since 45 or 46. It hasn't worked. Each decade, the rate of unemployment continues to rise to where we sort of now say if the rate of unemployment is is one percentage point less than the next digit of the of, of the of the next decade, it's all right. Uh, in the 50s, we said four percent. In the 60s, we said five percent. In the 70s, we said six percent. In the 80s, we say well, seven percent roughly is all right. Uh, what we have to do is redistribute existing work by shortening the working day or possibly the week or, or the year, I think. Uh, we haven't done anything like that since 1938 when we passed the 40-hour uh, week and the 8-hour uh, day and the 50-week year. So that's roughly 40 years of progress with automation and new technology. We still say the same old standards apply and unemployment continues to creep by about 1% uh, every decade. Uh, the second serious problem, I think, is that of dealing with, with agriculture. It's really combined agricultural overproduction and underuse around the world. And uh, I'd propose something similar to the Canadian Wheat Board, which is independent, really, to a large degree of government policy in the short run in somewhat the same way that the Federal Reserve System here is independent of direct government intervention. Uh, we ought to have a, uh, an agricultural board of some kind that could handle especially foreign trade. Uh, we've had at least three things done in the time I was in politics. One in the 50s, uh, there was a significant sale of wheat to Russia proposed, and it could have been continuing. It was stopped by the Eisenhower administration. Uh, then Carter cut off uh, the wheat sales. Uh, that was to China in the 50s. In, uh, at the time of Afghanistan, we were about to sell wheat to Russia. Carter cut that off. Reagan reinstated that, the embargo on grain, but Hague, who was uh, Secretary of State, intervened and said, we won't sell them any butter. Well, there are two things. One is uh, that we ought not to use agriculture for political purposes unless it's, it's a very serious matter. And the second is that the agricultural economy of this country needs help. And as I've looked at it for 40 years, the only way it seems to me that we could have a consistent uh, agricultural policy, both domestic and international, is to divorce it somewhat from day to day or year to year or election uh, to election uh, politics. Some time ago, my father lived to be 98, and I didn't want to, you know, just on the spur of the moment, give away sort of a, 25 years of longevity, which I may have inherited from him. So, it, it, I haven't, you know, I still quote Plutarch, who says, politics doesn't end, you know, and you're responsible. For it. And I don't have any immediate plan or program, but, uh, I, you know, Takes I a lot keep, of like Cincinnati, I keep plowing on the front 40, waiting for the, waiting for the call from Rome, and it hasn't come yet, so maybe I'll go to Rome and tell him I've been there. Well, I haven't. Uh, it takes a lot of money to run. Oh, yeah. That's one of the big problems, isn't it? I I don't know. I don't think it takes as much money as they. I mean, as, as people are spending. But the process of raising it now is is the most discouraging thing. I think it's the federal election law and the need to you know to get a thousand dollars from three or four thousand people to get started if you if you conform to the letter of the law, and. That takes a lot of doing. It's a lot easier to get, uh, you know, ten or twenty thousand from ten or fifteen people than to get a thousand dollars from two or three thousand. And uh, this is one of the products of the uh, of the uh, federal election law. And I remember talking to Senator Humphrey about it when he was making a kind of a bid in uh, 1980. I guess was the last time that he and he said, you know or 76. In any case, it was after the federal election law. And he said, I just can't campaign this way. He said, I, you know, his way was to have 10 or 15 or 20 friends uh, make significant contributions and then to go instead of the demand now is you've got to find two, three, four thousand persons and organize it and report it and, uh, and start it. And 
But that, to my mind, is a more serious problem with the system as it now works or doesn't work. Mm. We haven't had very good luck with ministers or even ministers' sons or candidates who had a strong religious identification. I, uh, back in uh, the election of 84, the Democrats were running, I think we had three sons of ministers on the ticket, or at least two. Walter Mondale was the son of a minister and uh, George McGovern was, and uh, he was also had been a minister himself. And uh, Gary Hart at least had studied for the ministry. So that uh, in that case you had three who were, had a very close relationship uh, to the ministry. In this campaign, uh, you have two active ministers. And uh, uh, I read the other day where Paul Simon's father was a Lutheran minister. So that you carry over a kind of religious strain, which is, I think, to be questioned in politics uh, from that religious identification, which often hurts a candidate, and I think it has an adverse effect uh, uh, on, on the political action of the person. Well, I, I sort of started out by stating what the, the classical condition of colonialism are, which are historically established. One is <coughs> soccer control over your own foreign policy and over your military policy, which is largely determined by the mother country in a true colonial situation. The second is lack of control over your economy. It means that usually the colony ships raw materials to the mother country and gets finished products in return. And that there's significant investment by the mother country in the colony. And also that the money of the colony is pretty much determined by the money or the financial system of the mother country. So the other two conditions are cultural. One is, well, more than cultural. One is lack of control over your borders in that uh, in, uh, in our colonial period there was no limit on, on uh, numbers or quality of people who came in and uh, in fact England used to ship criminals to Georgia and other places as they did to Australia and uh, the, the fourth the cultural one is you, a loss of control of, over your culture generally and that means language and religion. Yeah. And if all five of these, or five or six, however you want to count them, are applied to our condition today, uh, I think it's probably best called neocolonialism. It's not to a mother country, but it's, as the title of the book says, uh, sort of to sometimes real forces in history and some just kind of ideological pressures on us to respond in particular ways, which in effect take us out of history. And uh, the clearest example I use in the book was our involvement in Vietnam that nobody was responsible, that we have to go. Who's told us to come? You say, well, world communism, or the ideology did, or the Tonkin Resolution did, or the CETO Treaty told us to come. But they didn't. We just said they did, and so we went. Or the Pentagon says, we can go. That it, it, it removed the decision from what uh, I would describe as a kind of orderly and uh, historical context examination. We, the government, Congress, uh, had the defense budget down to about 15 or 16 billion dollars uh, after the end of World War II and before the Korean War. After the Korean War, it never came down again. It was 50, 60, 80, 90, 100, 200, 300 billion. And this all taking place without there being any really new historical threat to us. It just it, it began to build on itself. And uh, as I, I think that one of the interesting things in the book is the uh, uh, description of how the military-industrial complex thing developed. One was the, as you cited, the change of the name of the of the War Department, which is what we had during World War II, uh, to the Defense Department. And the significance of that is that once you say this is for defense, there are no limits. You know, if you say war, you say where's the war? Uh, the second, <coughs> second was the establishment of the Air Force, the third branch, which gave much more popular support. Uh, the, uh, the third was actually putting in place the military-industrial thing itself. And, and the fourth was the establishment of the so-called Volunteer Army, which was a mercenary army, which effectively, uh, in many ways, uh, separated the 
Defense Department from any kind of uh, particular judgment uh, and gave it uh, uh, political uh, support because of the Air Force primarily and then it gave it economic support. I suppose the person who's been most neglected and probably abused and, and the country has suffered has been Fulbright over the years. Carter, for example, there's no question but what he should have involved Fulbright. Or take this whole thing of missing in action. Uh, I don't think the administrations, or the Republican, or Democrat, ever sent anyone over there who hadn't been involved in the war against the Vietnamese. Uh, someone who had questioned it, like Fulbright, for example, might have been well received by the by the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, and said, "Look, you know, we under I understand, you understand, and what about it?" But instead of that, they sent people over uh, who were almost bound to, you know, to, to antagonize the Vietnamese. And then, of course, they were not recognized. It was another aspect of it. Uh, but this uh, neglect, especially, I think, of Fulbright, that began. I, I thought Fulbright deserved a cabinet post, even in the Kennedy administration, Secretary of State. Was, and they said, well, you know, he's not predictable. So, so what? You know, uh, they said, well, he doesn't like. Uh, a lot of people and said, well, nobody likes the Secretary of State. So they start even, you know. And he did not dislike people, he just had kind of harsh judgments that he made on various nations and people. And should have been there as I thought Secretary of State, but he wasn't. And the same thing's happening now. The, the uh, attitude is that uh, if, you know, if you don't meet certain age standards, I guess they use that on Herald and a little harder to use it on me, but I, I think underneath the, the rest of the network say, you know, why are you excluding me? They wouldn't say, I said to them, why don't you say it's age? You know, well, we can't say that. I said, well, if you won't say it, well, we'll assume that's what it is. And you guys are afraid of legal action for discriminating on the basis of age. But what you're really discriminating on is, is, uh, is a standard that's uh, less defensible even than that. At least it would make you honest. And also it was generally accepted that the television debate between Kennedy and, and Nixon probably swung the election to Kennedy. And following that, the, the, the proliferation of, of primaries, of course, took place. And um, beyond the proliferation of the primaries, the increased use of, of, of television. So we're asking the voters to make these very direct judgments, uh, almost face to face on first meeting uh, with the candidates. And it's very difficult to do that. Uh, uh, since that's the way it is, and uh, I don't see it changing very soon. I've tr tried to work out some rather general uh, standards that should be applied. First, on the positive side, I think you, you should look to a candidate uh, who has had some experience with the federal government, uh, either in the Senate, maybe in the House, or actively in an administration, so that you, he has a knowledge of of how that government operates. You should, of course, have a general association uh, with the critical domestic and foreign policy issues, but it doesn't have to be very detailed. Uh, this thing of saying he knows the numbers doesn't necessarily prove that he'd make a good, a good president. Uh, thirdly, I think he should indicate that he knows how the federal bureaucracy operates, uh, and especially the Pentagon what the forces are that run uh, in, in, in that body. And if he doesn't have this kind of knowledge and limited experience, it seems to me that uh, you're, you're picking a very high-risk uh, candidate. On the negative side, which some of them bear on what I've said, I think that probably governors who go directly from the governorship to the presidency are probably the worst candidates and that they bring to the office uh, an arrogance, saying, I know how to run the state, therefore I can run the federal government. Uh, it would be better if they had never run a state and came in uh, modestly and, uh, and with uh, humility and said, we say in the Senate it took, a, it took about six years for a, a senator who'd been a governor to get over being a governor. And that, he had six years to kind of work it out in the case of governors elected to the presidency why uh, they step in immediately. Well, almost so. I'll give you two examples, Jimmy Carter and uh, Ronald Reagan, and neither of whom, it seemed to me, had a proper understanding of the presidency. Yeah, but I was not in the uh, Senate when they allowed the draft law to retire, but I was on record as continuing the Citizens Army, 
with rather good support. You know, Thomas Jefferson advocated universal military service, uh, and he went back to the Greek city-state saying that as long as they had citizens' army, there was some con control and concern. And uh, Hamilton said, no, let's have a mercenary army. And neither one prevailed until uh, 1970 and Richard Nixon, at which time the Hamilton position took over. And what we had, in effect, has been a mercenary army uh, since the middle 70s. And this is the first war, this one, in which we've fought it with what, in effect, was a, was a mercenary non-citizens army. And I think Jefferson's concern, we haven't realized yet uh, the, the danger of it. But uh, in my mind, it, one of the, the, if you need a lesson out of a war, uh, the one out of this is that we really ought to be concerned about the power of the military now, since it has tremendous military and economic power, but also it's been insulated from public judgment. Uh, when it was debated, there were two arguments made. There were the pro-war people said, let's have an army that's hired and paid for and wants to fight so nobody will come along and say, we shouldn't be in this war. The people who should have opposed uh, the establishment of the so-called all-volunteer army uh, said, well, this is fine. If there's a war that we don't like, we won't have to fight it. So the, the whole thrust of it was to remove military action from political and social judgment. Sir, in, in our society, uh, we really don't have any place, especially for young men and especially young black males, but uh, people between the ages of about 18 and 21 or 22, unless they can go to college or go to the military, mm -hmm. there's really nothing for them to do except deliver fast food, you know. You can, if you're women, you can work at McDonald's. If you're men, you can work for Domino's Pizza. If you've got a lot of courage to drive Yeah, fast. that's right. But there's, this takes care of maybe half of them. The rest yeah. of them are like the... Uh, it's, it's sort of animal stuff. We yeah. sort of reject them the way the lions do. And people talk about the young lions as though young lions, but young lions are bad medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're out there in the desert looking for trouble. And we in our society are, are, as, are we're as primitive as lions are in terms of how we deal with this whole, you know, the earlier society, there were apprenticeships and uh, uh, there were squires who went with the knights. There mm -hmm. was a place to go. In our society, you just cut them out and say, you know, good for you, we'll see you when you're 23 or 24 if you're not in jail. Telstar News, which you don't hear on other news programs.